Welcome to First Class Fantasy. I'm Theo Greminger. Billy Muzio will be back with us next week, but I'm here today with my friend Josh Larkey of the 33rd team. Josh is a now a second time First Class Fantasy guest. He also appeared on press coverage with me this summer, and he also appeared on quite possibly the longest episode of Mind of Mansion <laughs> ever, but it's but I'm not sure because Matt's a long form podcast guy, but you crushed it on that last Mind of Mansion. I think that's your last time at Player Profiler. That was a couple weeks back. It feels like a year ago. We have so much football under our belt. How are you doing today, Josh? Let everybody know what you're doing at the 33rd team, when they can hear you on the air, and where they can find your articles. I read one today. It was great. Theo, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be back. I should have grown the beard out more if I knew Billy wasn't going to make it. Hopefully people think the beard is full. It's not. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, in terms of what to look for, my fantasy rankings drop on the 33rdteam.com every week on Tuesdays with a lot of player write-ups to help you understand how I'm viewing these players. That's all free to read on the site. And then we also drop a lot of prop bets into our Discord, and that's just LinkedIn. All of our articles that are on the site and the fantasy rankings, all the prop bets and Discord, that's free. Podcasting, I have a busy schedule like we all do. Uh, Ryan Reynolds and I podcast together on Monday and Thursday to talk fantasy and betting where I'm the analytics guy. Ryan's the film guy. And I think we have a nice little dynamic there. Tuesdays, he and I tag team the waiver wire show. And then on Fridays, the two of us join up with Ben Wolby, our data scientist to do the player prop happy hour. So it is a full schedule and all our content is free. So if you've already paid for player profiler, you don't have to worry. You can keep paying for it. You can check our stuff out as well. Yeah, and you've put together a great team over at the 33rd team. A big hat tip to you. Some really, really sharp guys. And I'll say that visually, your site looks great. I was reading, Josh provides his rankings, again, totally free. And I think you do a very good job with them. Uh, and you also provide some context to certain guys. And we're going to touch base on a couple of those guys. But highly recommend checking out Josh's great work. And then I say this every time you come on a pod, Josh has some evergreen articles that still exist on playerprofiler.com. Your ultimate guide to stacking, I think was the best stacking article I ever read in the fantasy space. And you have a number of other articles that I know Matt uh, will sometimes reference and, and a big hat tip to all your wonderful work you did here at Player Profiler and, and your continued success of the 33rd team. So we've had a kind of a wild start to the season. I mean, we... Every podcast yes. in America is spending like 20 minutes on Puka Nakua. So I'm going to, we'll, we'll, we'll briefly mention him today, but I wanted to see besides Puka Nakua, what has been the biz biggest positive surprise for you this season? Uh, I'll keep this one quick. I think it's Anthony Richardson, his poise, uh, his passing ability, how good the Colts offense has looked with him. The one caveat I'll mention though, is that he, he's now had back to back games with a head injury. Week one, he left during one of their goal line drives because of a collision, and then he was concussed in week two. I don't think he plays this week. But for someone who had like what, like 350 pass or whatever it was, pass attempts in college, the the guy looks really good. And I, I definitely faded him in fantasy this year. He was my QB one in dynasty, and I said, you know what? I think rookie year is a little early for this guy, given that he barely played in college. And so far, I've just eaten that. I have just taken it. Maybe things change and they go less aggressive now, but I have to say that he has looked so impressive and he he really seems like a fancy cheat code at this point. Yeah, so I, I have some Anthony Richardson in redraft and I have some in Dynasty, but it's the kind of player that after two games, you're like, whoa, I wish I would have gotten him everywhere. And yes. you know, this was like the answer to who is the late round quarterback that can really, really help our fantasy teams. It's Anthony Richardson if he's healthy, and our dynasty teams as well. Curious, you guys do some very quality dynasty content over at the 33rd team as well, like we do a player profiler. Uh, hat tip to Ian Miller. I've heard you guys do, do some stuff together, and Ian does a lot of great work. How high do you want to push him up in dynasty? I mean, how many quarterbacks can you legitimately say are more valuable than Anthony Richardson in terms of dynasty right now? It might be like five or six. Yeah, I'd say he's knocking on the door of a guy like Lamar Jackson at this point. Similar play styles. One guy just happens to be bigger and a lot younger. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, I don't know, like three, four weeks from now we go, hey, it's it's Patrick Mahomes, it's Josh Allen, it's Jalen Hurts, it's Justin Herbert, 
it's Joe Burrow. Maybe it's Trevor Lawrence. Is it Anthony Richardson? Is it Lamar Jackson? I think that's where all of a sudden we go, wait a second. This guy is like pretty much like forcing himself to the top six, top seven conversation. So I think he he's nearly there. I, I kind of want to see post concussion what stuff looks like, just because, like I said before, I think the game plan might change a little bit, given that you just cannot have a quarterback taking that much contact. Yeah, and it's it's crazy. The narrative on on the Colts changed so quickly where we were all just angry about the Jonathan Taylor situation. And now it's like we're so optimistic about Anthony Richardson smashing the rest of the season, challenging Cam Newton. How about on the flip side of the coin? You know, you spend a lot of time really analyzing situations, analyzing your approach to the to the upcoming season, finding the targets at ADP. You, you're, you leave no stone unturned. What is the biggest disappointment to you so far this season in terms of a player's performance or usage? I'm not going to go with a specific player here. I'm actually just going to say it's the Bengals offense. I I think that has been by far the most disappointing. I was very high on that offense going into the year. I had Jamar Chase 101 over Jefferson. That looks terrible right now. It's only two weeks. I'm not too worried yet. But uh, now, now Burrow's got the calf injury again. We'll kind of see what happens there. But I think the how I'll frame it is that Joe Mixon's usage has been incredible. Like he, he's getting all the touches. I think he can be like the RB five or six in fantasy. If this, this offense gets going again, we saw T Higgins have the incredible game this past week. Uh, Jamar chase has eight and nine targets in his first two games. So I think just across the board, you're like, all right, the fantasy numbers have been so disappointing aside from one T Higgins game. But I like the, the, the path is there for the, all these players to, to kind of be really successful. So I hope we're not looking at a 2022 Rams or, or Buccaneers or Packers situation where the offense we thought was going to be incredible is suddenly like bottom five. So I, I don't think that lasts. Yeah. That's a uh, very tilting to hear that come out of your mouth when you mentioned the 2022 Rams uh, and, and definitely the bucks as well. So I didn't quite think about it like that, but that, you know, that definitely gets me tilted. We're going to talk about, a number of these elite quarterbacks. We're also going to talk about some surprising early returns on these quarterbacks after we hear a word from our sponsors. This episode brought to you by Mojo. Mojo is that player stock market. We love Mojo because we like making lifetime bets on players. You run out the clock on these guys. Mojo just rolled out a brand new fantasy platform. That's right. So now you can build a portfolio of player props. Oh, Jamar Chase over 77.5. Oh, Kadarius Tony under 15.5. Whatever the under is on Kadarius Tony, doesn't matter. You can just stack up the props in your portfolio. And the beauty is, once the Sunday games kick off, it's not over. It's not over until it's over with Mojo because once those games kick off, you can then move in and out of positions. Let's say that you're well ahead of expectations. You can cash out. Let's say you're behind expectations. You're underwater. Well, you can double down. That's what makes Mojo so special, why they're different. Check it out. Go to the App Store. Get the Mojo app and use the promo code UNDERWORLD. The promo code UNDERWORLD. Gets you a 100% deposit match up to 100 bucks. So the promo code is UNDERWORLD, and they will match your deposit dollar for dollar. Go to Mojo, start building your portfolio, and then during the games, you can be a fantasy day trader. Welcome back to First Class Fantasy. I'm Theo Greminger, joined by Josh Larkey of the 33rd team. Josh, you uh, you tweeted out a photo recently. You're out there hiking with Dave Kluge. Did you guys discuss uh, First Class Fantasy appearances? We we did we did actually compare a little bit and how sometimes he's first, sometimes I'm first, and that we're starting to make our rounds in a similar fashion. So I think in terms of everyone in the industry, he and I seem to have the most similar of a job at this point. So it's very nice that we live within an hour of each other, that we hike together every other weekend or so. So I, I'd say it's cool in that sense, because I'm sure you know this, like it's it's the best job ever. It's also lonely at times. It can be stressful. And I think having someone that really gets it like Dave does. And I, I know that he's a fan of everything player profiler as well. That like, we just, we, he just kind of gets it. He's a smart guy. He, he knows how to market himself very well. And, uh, 
I always like having him as a guest as well, since he knows not just fantasy, but football. And I think that's kind of why we've always gotten along. It's like, it's important to have the fantasy takes, but if there's no football logic behind it, you're, you're going to be in trouble long-term. Yeah. I think it's a uh, big shout out to, uh, you know, the podcast he does with Alfredo Brown. They're putting out great mm-hmm. work um, over at football guys. And uh, yeah, he's a great guy and, and was a really good guest for ours. And we got a chance to go on his show as well, which was cool, but I'll say it's, you know, there's people listening on this show. I mean, certainly content creators. And then there's also like just the hardcore fantasy player who put so much into this and you can kind of set your clock around it. You know that you're setting lineups on a certain day. You know, you're setting your waivers on a certain day. You know, you're maybe in a trading league. You're trying to get trades done a certain day. It becomes such a cyclical thing. And you kind of walk around and people who are not involved in this have no idea the stresses you're going through and the the level of competition you have and for you Josh and for me certainly you want to be right you feel like you're you're putting a lot of like research into it and you want to be correct so yeah i think that's super cool and it's good to see you uh, enjoying where you're living and all that great stuff but the show must go on here at first class fantasy and we got to talk about these elite quarterbacks cuz this was the off season you know last time you were on we talked about our approaches to early quarterback drafting We talked to Josh about how he's handling, let's say, the Jalen Hurts, Josh Allen, uh, Patrick Mahomes tier on underdog and just reacting to the overall market. The early returns from these guys have not been good. Justin Herbert is the only early quarterback that appears in the top five scoring in most formats. Besides Joe Burrow, are there any other situations that you're super worried about? And um, maybe touch on Justin Fields a little bit. Yeah, that's the one I'm I'm worried about. I felt like I was one of the the few people who wasn't gung ho about Justin Fields this off season. It wasn't like I was fading him. I didn't quite have the stones to be like this is a terrible pick. But I was kind of like, you know what? I'm definitely getting less Fields than other people. And my concern was, it looks like they want him to pass more. But he's a very good runner, and sure enough, uh, he's throwing more. Justin Fields has passed at least 29 times in both games. He never hit 29 pass attempts in any game last year. So clearly they're, they're, they're trying to get the pass game going more. The problem is that this guy just takes sacks like nobody's business. The sack rate was 12% as a rookie, 15% last year, 13% this year. It is bananas that every six to seven dropbacks, he is taking a sack. You simply cannot have that. And I, I think he's kind of at risk, especially like in dynasty of, being a guy that that never plays after his rookie contract in a, a starting role. Yeah, it's I mean you could it's very hard to even find a situation where a guy smashes fantasy wise and in 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 fantasy but then struggles so much in real football. But real football we always say doesn't matter for our thing, but it does matter for quarterbacks because if you can't win NFL games, they replace you. Whether it's short term, whether it's long term, and Justin Fields is if he flames out of Chicago, it's not like teams are going to be lining up looking to grab Justin Fields either. He might have to have a situation where he's a backup or he might have to take a Jameis Winston like situation where, you know, he's like a quarterback in waiting or de facto quarterback in wait in waiting. So it's absolutely uh, a mess for Justin Fields drafters. I know I have a couple Justin Fields teams. He's got Kansas city this weekend and a lot of people are streaming the Kansas city defense. Uh, off the top of your head, how high did you have them in your rankings, Josh? Uh, oh God, I, I Rel- think Kansas City was top five, if yeah. I remember correctly. Yeah, so you're yeah, on that it, train too. I mean, yeah, if, if the guy's going to take a sack every six to seven dropbacks, you're going to want to start fantasy defenses against that player who simply does not know when to throw the ball. Yeah, and I think for the other you know elite elite tier quarterbacks, I think they'll be fine. The only guy I want to kind of pick your brain on is Trevor Lawrence because Trevor Lawrence is off to a very slow start, but it's the first game he looked great. But then week two, obviously, we had the biggest fantasy letdown in quite some time with that Jacksonville-Kansas City game. Do you have any concerns about the Jacksonville offenses, or is this a get-right spot against Houston this week? I I hope this is a get-right spot. The the fantasy results haven't been great, but the other thing that's been worrisome, again, just two-week sample, I think Lawrence is fine. It's not a Justin Fields situation where I actually think the guy might just be bad at football. Uh, When we look at... EPA per drop back per pass attempt. The Jaguars are the second worst team in the NFL right now. So that's a real football stat that shows that the Jaguars pass offense has been atrocious. 
I do not think that continues. I, I believe injecting Calvin Ridley helps. We saw in week one, they were, they were relatively effective for the most part. Though, again, that was a pretty cake matchup with the Colts. So I'm going to give it a few more weeks. I'm not super concerned about it. But I do think there's stuff to monitor there where maybe they shift the play calling a little bit. I, I know like week one, Christian Kirk like didn't play much. Week two, Zay Jones gets banged up and Calvin Ridley gets banged up. There, there's a lot uh, in flux in that receiver room where last year it was just the poster child of consistency where Rid or where where Kirk, Zay Jones, and Evan Engram are all pretty much perfectly healthy aside from like one game. So essentially, I I, I think Lawrence is going to be fine. But like real football fantasy, it has not been kind to them through two weeks. Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's a very tilting tilting week for Jacksonville managers. It's a little bit tilting for Calvin Ridley managers. I mean, he could have had a touchdown this past week and people would have been a little less freaked out, but it seems like it's a uh, Christian Kirk against teams who play man. Um, it's, it could be a little bit of a mess, but you know, at the end of the day, they're going to score some points. Let's talk about some quarterbacks who have been surprisingly effective and not necessarily surprising, but I think to the extent of where they're at in terms of the overall scoring it's a little surprising right now Jordan Love in most formats is top three and Sam Howell is inside of the QB1 line and you have Mac Jones inside of there and obviously Russell Wilson who was helped out a little bit by the late Hail Mary but he'd still be there even if you took out that Hail Mary of those four guys which are the most intriguing and you can give multiple answers on this one we're going to rifle through these guys. I still think Sam Howell is probably pretty bad at football. My favorite commander stat, one of my favorites of the season, is that we have seven different players through two weeks to hit 40 receiving yards on the commanders. Seven different players have all hit 40 receiving yards once. Nobody's reached 55 receiving yards on this team. So it's been this weird spread I'm set up. I guess ultimately, like maybe that means Sam Howell's making some good decisions. I haven't seen that much from him. I don't think it continues. He's running less than last year. We should be concerned. Jordan Love, uh, woof, regression's going to hit this guy. He's currently pacing for 442 pass attempts. That would be like third worst in the league last year. Yet he's also pacing for 51 passing touchdowns and no interceptions. I'm inclined to think that he doesn't keep tossing touchdowns at a historic rate. Mac Jones, uh, the, the play calling is much better. It looks like Bill O'Brien's been very good for him. I think Mac Jones is fine. Fantasy quarterback two-ish, probably on the lower end, just given the weapons. The guy I'm very excited about is Russell Wilson. Jerry Judy's going to get more integrated. Greg Dulcich will return in a few weeks. Ultimately, here's a stat that I think is very exciting. If you like Russell Wilson, who's always passed for a lot of touchdowns. There have been 17 red zone pass and run plays this year by the Broncos. 12 of them, 71% have been pass plays. Incredibly encouraging. No player on this team has more than one red zone carry on the season. This is the Russell Wilson show in the red zone. And I think we have to like that for fantasy football. Yeah. And, I, and I'll give you a big hat tip because last year you were fading the Denver Broncos stacks that everybody were, were cramming in and you read that completely perfectly. So we're going to we're going to say Josh is is on point with his Denver calls and he's on this Russell Wilson train. Russell Wilson's still available in some leagues. Uh definitely try to pick him up. We're very intrigued about Marvin Mims, uh you know, in his increasing role as well, which is exciting. Um give a the the chat is lit right now, guys. Uh shout out to Jose Peña. Hit the like button. Let's support First Class Fantasy and Josh there's a lot of people who want you on here weekly. Do you have the time for a weekly player profiler show at this point? Uh, at this point, we we might be able to make it happen. So if, if the if the listeners want it, I, I can talk to the people upstairs. But I think there's a good chance we can make this happen. Awesome, man. Awesome. So, yeah. um, so let's pivot off of quarterbacks. Let's talk about some running backs. Two running backs that are, you know, having incredible starts are Brian Robinson and Kyron Williams. Brian Robinson was the kind of guy that you were getting in the eighth, ninth, occasionally the tenth round of drafts. And Kyron Williams was a guy that we've actually talked about on First Class Fantasy, but we weren't like magicians. We were saying to draft him in like the 18th round, 17th, 18th round, because he was the clear handcuff to Cam Akers. Little did we know that McVay wanted to, you know, completely nuke Cam Akers. Cam Akers <laughs> is now a Viking, and Kyron Williams has RB1 usage and RB1 production. How confident are you 
in Kyron Williams. I thought that you had a, a very reasonable yet bullish ranking on him this week. Yeah, so out of these two players, I whiffed on Kyron Williams. I, I was not very excited about him this year. I, I didn't think the Rams' run game would be all that much of anything. I, I didn't like the offensive line. I started to get concerned towards the end of the offseason about Cooper Cup's injury. Kyron Williams is really slow. He's a good pass catcher, but Stafford's never targeted running backs really in his career for the most part. There have been a couple seasons here and there, but McVay's never really targeted the running back position either super heavily. Some people are like, well, Todd Gurley. Todd Gurley had like the most efficient receiving back seasons kind of ever when he was with McVay. Like he, he was getting targeted at a solid rate, but it actually wasn't what people think. Like the, the running back's never been that involved in the past game. So of course, Kyron Williams has his 10 targets last week. I think he's here to stay. They, they got rid of Cam Akers. There is nobody behind Williams. It is Zach Evans, who I think is just a major injury risk and has no pass catching ability. It is Ronnie Rivers. That sounds like a creative player name. So I, I definitely missed on, on Kyron. He wasn't one of my preferred late round running backs, but I did hit on Robinson with Brian Robinson. I was like, guys, he was out touching Antonio Gibson last year. Over 17 carries a game as a rookie. And sure enough, here he is once again. 40 touches for Robinson, nine for Gibson through two weeks. So I think both these guys at this point are here to stay. And with the state of the running back position, we just have to like that because, I mean, woof. I when I did my rankings this week, I'm going to pull them up quickly. It, it got really bleak after running back. For me, it was running back seven. I thought I had seven running backs where I was like, this guy's going to get all the touches and I trust him. And after seven running backs, I went, wow, we have a cliff. So at least we're getting a few other guys into the mix with Williams and Robinson. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's definitely crazy times when you got to put Zach Moss inside of your top 20 with confidence. Uh, and uh, let's talk a little bit more about Zach Evans because Zach Evans was a guy that I picked up a lot last night in waivers and he's sitting there on a lot of waiver wires. I think that this is a guy that if we're trying to roster handcuffs, if something were to happen to Kyron Williams, they couldn't possibly roll out Ronnie Rivers expecting anything. I think Zach Evans, you know, you bring up the lack of pass catching ability, but he's certainly the more talented back than Ronnie Rivers, wouldn't you say? Yeah, he he's he has pretty elite metrics as a, a runner. For him, it's always been injuries, and he's a zero in the pass game. But I, I think what we're seeing right now out of, out of this Rams offense, it's functional enough that a grinder back could be fantasy relevant. And I think if anything happens to Williams, I mean, for all we know at this point, they might just force some, some pass usage into Zach Evans out of necessity. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting one. If you're looking to clean up waivers, you can grab them for a dollar in a lot of these leagues. And Brian Robinson, it's interesting that the, the great stat is – that Washington leads the league in, in running back screen passes attempted. They've completed four out of five. And last year they only had like 10 attempted screen passes to running backs. They hardly ever ran screens for Antonio Gibson last year. And now they're doing it for Brian Robinson. Eric bien has definitely got that offense uh, pointing up tilting next two weeks though. They've got Buffalo and they've got Philly. I think that that could, you know, if they go one of two, you're feeling great about Washington and, and Sam Howell and all that kind of stuff. Let's talk about these rookie running backs, Josh. Uh, you know, obviously, B. John Robinson, we could spend half an hour talking about how great he is. I uh, highly recommend my episode of press coverage this week with Ray Garvin, uh, where he said he's the the next LaDainian Tomlinson, which really got me excited. But we also have Jameer Gibbs. David Montgomery is going to miss this week and probably a few more weeks with a quad injury. And then you also have two other running backs who are very intriguing in Devon A. Chain and Kendra Miller who could have a path this week. What is the more likely scenarios of these three? Jameer Gibbs finishes inside the RB1 line or Devon A. Chain or Kendra Miller has a really, really big game? I, I'm going to go with Gibbs. I have him in my top 12 right now. He's had seven carries in each game. But you know what? Why would we care about that when the guy just led his team with nine targets, a 27% target share this past week? I think with Montgomery out of the picture for the next week or two, Craig Reynolds looks like that between the twenties guy who might uh, grab the, the occasional red zone goal line carry. I think ultimately the team's just going to be a little more pass heavy in the red zone and at the goal line without Montgomery, which favors Gibbs given that he's the, the guy that would catch these passes. So right now I have Gibbs in my top 10. 
I have Craig Reynolds at RB42 this week. I don't actually think they finish quite that far apart, but I'm not in the fantasy pros rankings competition. I don't, I don't worry about stuff like that. When I'm ranking, what I'm trying to do is signaling to people that follow my rankings, how to make decisions. And what I'm saying is, Hey, I have Gibbs in a place where like, you just, you have to start him this week. And I have Craig Reynolds in a place where I'm kind of saying, Hey, I know Montgomery has been awesome. I, I don't think he's getting the Montgomery role. I think Montgomery is actually like kind of good at football and that he's earned that kind of role. So I, I think with Gibbs, we can once again, see him flirting with Amon Ross St. Brown for the lead in team targets. And I'm very excited about that game. I think Detroit Atlanta has a little bit of shootout potential, not shootout potential in the sense of a ton of passing from the Falcons shootout potential in terms of two offenses running efficiently. I love it. I love it. I'm definitely looking forward to that as well. A lot of Bijan and Jameer Gibbs uh, exposure. So I'll be tilting a little bit in that game as I'm sure you will as well. Quick thoughts on Kendra Miller. Kendra Miller has not played the first two games of the season. Jamal Williams goes down and we're one week away from Alvin Kamara coming back. Saw a lot of people adding some Tony Jones last night. Uh, some crazy bids on Tony Jones. Yes. I think that hundreds. that's, it's crazy. It's crazy. You saw like the irrational exuberance and shout out to the, to the chat, like Craig Reynolds. I added Craig Reynolds, but I got a couple of shares for like 17 out of a thousand, like 1.7% bid. I saw people spending 180, 200, uh, 20% type bids mm-hmm. on Craig Reynolds. I think they could be very disappointed with that. But the Tony Jones one, I mean, Tony Jones is not a very good football player. And now he's got a Kendra Miller problem. How do you think it's going to shake out in a one week slate here? So I, I just don't think Tony Jones is the long term option. But I think the Saints are going to play it conservatively. They, they just have a really easy schedule this year. I think they just want to try and win games. I don't think Miller's going to have quite as much work this week as we want. And I think if he gets dropped, then people should scoop him back up. Since I think long-term it's going to be Kamara and probably Miller as the, the two more exciting backs where Jamal Williams is fine. We, we, we like him. He's a fine player, but ultimately he just doesn't have that dynamic explosive running ability that Miller does. And he's not the, the slick pass catcher that Kamara is. So I think this week, I, I really don't think any Saints running back is particularly exciting to start. But I, I think Miller could be the guy next week where you're scooping him up for cheap since that's what I did this week. I got Craig Reynolds for under $50 in several FFPC leagues, whereas I saw Tony Jones routinely going for 100 to 250 and I thought that was insane because I don't even – I think he's a zero-week rental. I think he gets a little more work than Miller. I'm not sure if you can start him this week. So, yeah, Tony Jones, let him stay on waivers. Yeah, I think it was the like the excitement of the last two weeks of the waiver wire, and people are just going for it. That they're going ham. No one's trying to keep you know like any powder dry. They're spending it early, and um, you know that's one way to. At least you don't have to grind waivers every single week if you have no more money, Josh. There is a there's a plus to that. There's a little bit of a plus to that in terms of lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, Devon A chain. Devon A chain looks like he might get a much larger opportunity this week. The running backs coach was talking up, uh, you know, his potential involvement and how he can do it all. What are your thoughts on Devon A. Chain? How optimistic are you for him developing throughout the season and being a guy that we could potentially put in our fantasy lineups? I'm quite optimistic rest of season. I just think we're we're still a little bit early with him. Ultimately, I think the situation's great. Salvan Ahmed got banged up last week. Raheem Mostert has never been able to stay healthy for more than a few weeks at a time. Jeff Wilson's still on injured reserve. The Dolphins offense looks like maybe the best unit overall in the NFL right now. So I I think that's all reason for optimism. And he really fits what they want to do. They're stacking speed. Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, and then just track stars at running back. And I I think with A-Chain, we don't even need more than 10 to 12 touches a week from him long term for him to be an every week fantasy starter. I think we're probably still another week early on him, if not two weeks early, but I I would keep him on the bench regardless of what he looks like in week three, just given that if we love an offense and we know that a player fits into it well, theoretically, then then we should be very patient with that guy. Yeah. And Raheem Mostert, great start, but he's only played more than 15 games twice. It's shocking how few games he's played most seasons in his career. Uh, Last year was, I think, the most games he's ever played at 16. So I don't, I'm not buying it. I think if you, if you got Raheem Mostert, it's been a really, really nice early season return. 
but you've got to be able to pivot, um, you know, and have some options for the next few weeks. So guys like Miller, guys like A-Chain, go grab them if they're available in your league. Christian McCaffrey off to a, a torrid start. This is the kind of guy where you, you reference Jamar Chase. If Jamar Chase drafters who were taking him at the 102 or the 103 had simply gone Tyreek Hill or Christian McCaffrey, that's the difference between being 0-2 and or being 2-0. and We don't really need to delve into McCaffrey. His usage is fantastic. His production is fantastic. He's ripping off long runs. And we haven't even seen him have to catch passes because they've been killing people. Where are you at on a running back that you would you would bet on to finish as RB1 overall if it is not Christian McCaffrey? Right now, I'd bet on Tony Pollard. I never would have imagined that this guy, who's always been a timeshare back, I know people are like, oh, but he was so talented. Yeah, but he's also built a little bit like a receiver. He played receiver in college. He's never had a large workload. And sure enough, he has the best role in fantasy among running backs. 20 carries a game, five and a half targets a game. Uh, as long as his workload doesn't break him, I, he's my rest of season RB1 at this point. I love that. And I saw you had him as RB1 in your rankings this week, which was really exciting yes. to see. And you've got to think tonight, if they're in control on a short week, that they're going to mix in Elijah Mitchell. Uh, they can't keep giving McCaffrey every single snap, um, but it's been great to see. I, I would say Pollard would be the guy I would bet on, but don't sleep on Bijan Robinson. Because I think we're going to see some massive games with the way he's catching the football. And, uh, you know, we still haven't seen Atlanta in a game where they're trailing a lot, where they might just throw to, to B. John Robinson pretty much every time, which, you know, you could see him have a couple of nine, 10 reception games that could really, really push up his total. Currently the the team leader in targets in the yeah. Falcons. On pace for 85 receptions, Josh. It's it's uh, it's wild times. We we didn't we didn't think Arthur Smith had it in him, and I don't like complimenting Arthur Smith, but hat tip for your your B. John Robinson usage. How about Cleveland? Catastrophic news on Nick Chubb. Terrible for Browns fans, terrible for the Cleveland Browns, awful for Nick Chubb, terrible for us fantasy managers. How is this offense gonna look on a week to week basis without the focal point of their team in Nick Chubb? This has been a Stefanski wants to run the ball. They, they built things around Nick Chubb despite getting Deshaun Watson, despite getting all these wide receivers. It's been a Nick Chubb offense. How is it going to look moving forward? Uh, I think it has to be a little pass heavier. Some people have asked me like, oh, does that mean that we should start bumping up Deshaun Watson, Amari Cooper, Elijah Moore, David Joku? No, I, I think what we're going to probably get with some pass volume should be offset mostly by just decreased efficiency. Nick Chubb's one of the few running backs in football that I think truly matters. Defenses are going to be playing the Browns differently with Jerome Ford back there. I think Ford's going to be getting 10 to 15 carries, few targets a week. I think he's the, the guy to own in this backfield. I think Kareem Hunt's going to be in the Kareem Hunt-ish role that he's been in whenever he's been in Cleveland. Some people think he's going to start over Jerome Ford. I think that's a little silly. If they wanted him to play over Jerome Ford, they wouldn't have chosen Jerome Ford over Kareem Hunt two months ago. So I, I think what we could see is that Ford's not quite in the Chubb role. Hunt is not quite in the Hunt role of years past. And then we see a little bit of Pierre Strong mixed in since ultimately he is the one super big play guy. I We like that Jerome Ford had the 69 yard run on national television, but ultimately Pierre Strong runs in the four threes. That is the the more exciting runner per touch when he's on the outside. And I think they're they're probably going to want to mix him in because it's just not that fast of an offense once you lose Chubb and switch to Jerome Ford. It's, we, we need some explosive plays, and I think Strong will we'll probably get a few touches each week. Yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued by Ford. Ford is, is explosive. He's got speed. Uh, and he can catch the football. And, you know, I think you you nailed it. It's going to be Kareem Hunt in the Kareem Hunt role, but a less explosive uh, kind of, I'm not cooked, but getting there, Kareem Hunt. So I, I definitely would, would bet on Ford. Um, I saw some people with some wild Kareem Hunt bids. I added Kareem Hunt for like 15, 16% in a league or two just in case. But I saw some people going north of uh, 50% in a couple leagues, which I do not think is going to, Give them any positive ROI there, Josh. Um, and want to talk about these rookie wide receivers. Puka Nakua is obviously the greatest player in the history of football, so we don't really have to touch on him. You want to listen about Puka Nakua, 
tune into any other podcast in America this week, you'll hear 20 minutes on him. But Zay Flowers and Jordan Addison are knocking on the door of your wide receiver two weekly rankings this week. I love both. I have exposure to both. What are your thoughts on both early on and their growing roles in their offense? So we'll start with Zay Flowers. His average depth of target is six. That's kind of like a tight end. We don't like that. What we do like, though, is that Rashad Bateman looks like he's kind of out of the picture. He's been running significantly fewer routes than Zay Flowers, than Odell Beckham. He's had exactly three targets in each game. And I think that what we really wanted is someone to take a backseat. I leaned that it was going to be Zay Flowers, then Bateman, then OBJ. It looks like we can probably flip it, and it's Zay Flowers, Beckham, and then uh, Bateman is kind of the the, the clear number three. And the, this kind of two-man show at receiver is very good because I think the last thing we wanted was like a true three-man rotation where they're all playing like 80% of the snaps. So very, very good news for Zay Flowers. They're scripting and plays. We want to see the depth of target rise a little bit. I think this is actually the week it could happen, playing the worst cornerback unit in the league with the Colts. And then with Addison, he's been playing really well in football. He's been playing well for fantasy football. And KJ Osborne's still running significantly more routes. So I think that can only make us very excited about Addison, where all the efficiency metrics and the raw production has favored him on fewer opportunities. Both of them, I think, are like wide receiver 18, 20 ish rest of season for me where I'm just starting these guys each week at this point. Yeah. I think it's set it and forget it for these guys. And we love how consolidated Minnesota is and the Zay flowers. I've seen a couple of people that are pretty sharp, but they've said that he's kind of a gimmick player that he's a manufactured touch player. I don't see that. I see a very, very talented wide receiver that can kind of win in different ways what are your thoughts on on him just as a pure talent, Josh? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you completely. I, th- I think it's there. Uh, I think being able to win as a receiver and win on manufactured touches as well, that's what Debo Samuels often had. He's generally been decent in fantasy. So, yeah, I, I think no qualms about that. Yeah, no, I love it. And uh, shout out to the chat. The chat is lit right now. A lot of people viewing. Josh, I got to say, I love your rankings, but there was one ranking that really got me sad, got me depressed, and it deeply affected me, and it was your ranking of Garrett Wilson. Back-to-back weeks with a a beautiful touchdown last week against Dallas, a wonderful running catch. In week one, he had maybe the catch of the year, but you got him at wide receiver 31. Very sad to see. I think you're spot on, though, with it. Is this just a mega talent in a low-volume offense? Do you have any hope? that this offense can change and find ways to get Garrett Wilson the ball, get him more targets, or is this going to be purely conservative, you know, hide Zach Wilson as much as possible? Yeah, unfortunately, as long as Zach Wilson's quarterback, I think it's all bad news. If you have Zach Wilson at quarterback and Dalvin Cook and Brees Hall in the backfield, it makes sense why you would be extremely, extremely run heavy and that when you throw the ball, it's conservative. Garrett Wilson's pacing for 110 targets. That's pretty low. 60 catches. Oh God, we don't like that either. 995 total yards. Oh, we don't like that either. We we were hoping he'd have 13, 1400, but 17 touchdowns. He's had a touchdown in both games. I, I do an expected fantasy points model that I put into my fantasy rankings in those tables. And I think with Garrett Wilson, it's illuminating. He's been the wide receiver 23 in fantasy points per game. He's been the wide receiver 39 in usage. And to put it another way, you start the wide receiver 23 in fantasy every week. That's wide receiver two. You're probably not starting the wide receiver 39. A guy that's not quite even a fantasy wide receiver three. You're like, oh, that's that's kind of my flex bench type option. That's what the usage from Wilson has been. I do not think he continues to score a touchdown every three and a half catches for the rest of the season when Zach Wilson is his quarterback. Sad times, sad times, guys. And I'll say this, that the uh, the Jets-Bills game, has about as low of a of a Vegas total as you'll ever see in September. It's it's creeping lower and it's going to be raining during the game as well. This might be a 13-10, 10-7 type game. Uh this is going to be an ugly one for fantasy if you have pivots, if you're trying to stay away from this game, I I highly recommend that. Um quick question from the chat. Well, not really a question, but a comment is Josh Reynolds. Josh Reynolds is a guy that I added in a number of leagues last night, and I had some from 
the beginning of the season because I was going to trying to get that free look in leagues like FFPC where, you know, you hope for a good game on game one and you just keep them when he has a decent game. But does this give you optimism for Jamison Williams when he comes back? Or is this more of a, hey, Josh Reynolds is just playing great football? Yeah, I think it gives me a lot of optimism for JMO. And I think until JMO comes back, Josh Reynolds is perfectly fine to start. I have him wide receiver 40 this week. So, like, I mean, hey, if you're in a deeper league, I'm like, yeah, go for it. I think even if you're in a more competitive league, it's not the worst flex play to have. At least four catches and 66 yards in both games now. He He's running all the routes. Uh, I think it's it's the kind of offense that's going to be pretty consolidated with the targets where I think we kind of knew it would be Amon Ra, Gibbs, maybe Laporta, who en- has, has ended up looking pretty good, and then whoever this wide receiver two is. And we never really knew who it was going to be. I know in best ball, I just kind of hedged where I loved whoever this was going to be, and I would take a lot of JMO, and then later in the draft, take Reynolds or Marvin Jones, where I was like, you know what? It could be the veteran, Marvin Jones. It might just be Josh Reynolds, who has rapport with Jared Goff back from their Rams days, as many of us remember. And yeah, I think Reynolds at this point is here to stay until JMO returns. I don't think he's dust when JMO comes back, but I think he's going to be kind of more of a rotational player. And yeah, it definitely makes me excited where I think once week four hits, if JMO's on the waiver wire, you should scoop him. Quick comment in the chat. You have Roshan Johnson and Khalil Herbert next to each other. Which one are you starting if you had to start one? Oh my God. I mean, like you technically Just say start... Roshan. Just say Roshan, Josh. You don't I, even want to say it. I'm going to have to flip him because I believe I have Khalil Herbert one spot ahead of him. And the more I just have thought about it, I, I've already actually bet on some Roshan receiving props this week. I, I think the game script's going to favor him. Uh, I'll flip it after the show. We'll go with Roshan. Love it. You heard it first. Josh Larkey flipping his rankings live We're on First it. Class Fantasy. The chat, you influenced it, guys. There you go. Uh, when you came on First Class Fantasy last, Billy, you and me, we all talked about these breakout offenses. We talked about Baltimore. We talked about Los Angeles Chargers with their new play callers. Who have been like the play caller that's kind of uh, surprised you? Is there any team that's doing anything stylistically or doing anything uh, that's just surprising in terms of usage in a very positive way, in a positive light. This answer is easy, and it's not what people expect, but I think I'll sell the audience by the end of it. It's Bobby Slowick, the offensive coordinator for the Texans. He came over from San Francisco. He was their pass game coordinator. One thing San Francisco does not do, they do not run 11 personnel. For those that are terrified by that term, it essentially means there's three receivers on the field, one running back and one tight end. As we all know, the, the Niners never really did that. There's never been a third receiver that was ever consistent there. But uh, what have we seen from the Texans? Oh, all they do is run 11 personnel. And it provides passing yards for Stroud. He's been, I, I've called it the garbage time Olympics, where it's just like, oh, like every single week where we're just getting fantasy points. And here, here's the, the mind-blowing stat from all this, where we've always had three receivers on the field for the Texans. Only the Dolphins have more wide receiver fantasy points through two weeks than the Texans. That is a real stat. What what did we see last week? We saw Nico Collins, Robert Woods, and Tank Dell get there. The week before, we saw Nico Collins and Robert Woods get there. We've now had five fantasy relevant receiver performances through two weeks. And I think that trend only continues when uh, it's the garbage time Olympics, my favorite time of the year. I love it. I had a question about Nico Collins and Tank Dell, but you but you answered it. We love it. And CJ Stroud had 384 passing yards this past week. The offensive line is completely banged up. Damian Pierce can't do a thing. So this is going to be, I think Nico Collins might be the sneaky play for the wide receiver that finishes inside of the wide receiver two line. And I think yes. Tank Dell could be legitimately a wide receiver three moving forward. I'm, I had him very high up in my waiver wire rankings. Um, I'm into Tank Dell right now. And this is a guy that I didn't love in the draft process, but... We pivot. One guy we've got to really pivot on, though, is Najee Harris. Is Najee Harris completely cooked? Do you have optimism that he's going to turn it around? And how are you treating Jalen Warren and Najee Harris uh, if you have them as options to put in your lineup? So I'm, I'm still Team Harris over Team Warren for this week and maybe the next week or two. But I think we it's one of those situations where I, I might flip next week or the week after. 
where it feels like it's like the, the Khalil Herbert Roshan Johnson, where I'm like, you know what, whatever live on air. I will. I just made an adjustment and I have Roshan ahead. I, I think we're, we're getting close to that area. I see the, the Harry snowman in the comments says Najee looks slow. I agree. When you look at the advanced metrics, Najee Harris last week or I like on Monday night averaged negative one and a half yards before contact, but five and a half yards after contact. So you might be like, Oh, that's exciting. Like Najee Harris is breaking tackles. The way that I see it ultimately is that the Pittsburgh offensive line is not great. The holes are not very large and Najee Harris is simply not fast enough to hit the hole like Jalen Warren can. The, the other concern outside of just Najee Harris being slow is that week one, Najee Harris was a workhorse until the game got out of hand. And then Warren came in and was running routes, was receiving carries when they got blown out by the Niners. But on Monday night, both Najee Harris and Jalen Warren each ran 15 routes. Warren caught four passes for 66 yards. Najee Harris caught one of his targets for zero yards. Like that, that, whoa, that is that is pretty concerning. If Najee Harris is going to be too slow to hit the hole in the run game, and then in the pass game is suddenly seeing equal opportunities to Jalen Warren with routes. So uh, depending on how week three goes, I wouldn't be afraid to flip them afterwards. The the one shimmering light is that they face the Raiders who have allowed five and a half yards per carry to running backs through two weeks. Yeah, it's I have no optimism for Najee Harris. I mean, it's crazy to see a guy that we thought was going to make his bones as a big time receiver in fantasy have this sharp of a decline as a receiver. And that was like the hope of a bounce back this year. On the flip side, I love Jalen Warren. I hope they get him more and more touches. I think this is like the third sequel to the first movie was Austin Eckler should get more touches than Melvin Gordon. Yeah. Then the sequel was amazing. It was Tony Pollard should get more touches than Zeke Elliott. Now it's get Jalen Warren the damn football. How about George Pickens? George Pickens had a smash game on Monday night. Very much looks the part of an alpha. A lot of analytics people don't like him, Josh. They say he can't separate, but he sure looked good on Monday, and I, I love his talent. Yeah, I want to see a little more from him. I, I think this was a very encouraging game. He had 10 targets. No other receiver or tight end on the, on the team had more than four. Uh, I think at least with Deontay Johnson on IR, he's an every week starter. I still do have concerns about his ability to earn targets where it's not even that I think he's a bad player. I just don't love that the Steelers offensive line's not great and that Pickens is a, a boundary receiver running routes pretty far down the field. So I don't think that's kind of like the right combination necessarily for consistency long-term, but I think at least until Deontay returns, I, I love what I saw this past week. And Johnson, as we know, he's on IR. That means at least four weeks, we have at least three more Pickens games without him. With Pat Frymuth, it's a head scratcher. Who knows what's happening? All I know is at this point, I'll, I'll just want to start George Pickens right now moving forward. Yeah, start George Pickens every week, everyone. And another... Uh... We talk about consolidation. One of the, You mentioned this earlier when we were discussing Jordan Addison, but Justin Jefferson is doing Justin Jefferson things. K.J. Osborne has had his moments, some drops, but he's had his moments, and Jordan Addison has scored in back-to-back -back games. But T.J. Hawkinson is your tight end one overall. Had a terrific game against Philadelphia. It is getting great usage. He's finding the end zone. How bullish should we be on TJ Hawkinson? Is this the cheat code drafters needed to get this year at the tight end position? I think so. I, I loved Hawkinson this offseason. I was like, guys, we just saw him get usage like Travis Kelsey on the Vikings. And now he's playing 2023 again on the Vikings. If I even have a tight end sniffing Kelsey usage and I can take him in the fifth round, I'm just going to do that very, very often. With Hawkinson, I, I think he's great rest of season. The, the one thing I'll, I'll say is he might not be quite as good. I think he's still going to be a top three tight end option, maybe even just the tight end two rest of season. But uh, if Jordan Addison takes over KJ Osborne, which I think we all expect to happen, Addison's had a higher targets per route run, a higher yards per route run, bet, better everything than Osborne. So I think ultimately if he plays more, that's slightly more competition for targets for Hawkinson. But but still, I mean, if the if the guy has at least seven catches in both games, what what are we really all that concerned about? Yeah, they gave him the contract, and they're sure seeing a return on investment there. Josh, we're we're a little pressed for time this week. You've been you've been really generous. We started a little bit late. 
Um, but I want to get your big, bold prediction for this week. Do you have any big fantasy prediction uh, that can help fantasy managers in week three? Yeah, some people, like we talked about before, they're tired of these elite quarterbacks. They're, they're not doing what they wanted. But I think against the league's worst cornerback unit this week of Indianapolis, who I think fantasy managers should target every single week, this is the week that in this new Todd Monken offense, Lamar Jackson throws for 300 yards, three touchdowns, and runs another one in, and he finishes convincingly by more than five fantasy points as the QB1 overall for week three. I love it. And I'm going to say Sam Howell continues being unbeaten as Washington starter. Washington beats Buffalo and Ooh. Jahan Dotson finishes as a top 10 wide receiver this week. The, the Jahan Dotson end of uh, end of draft season steam drafters are going to get a nice reward. Washington gets a signature win. Jahan Dotson has a signature game. Josh, let everybody know where they can find you and the stuff you have coming out. Theo, thanks again for having me. Always a pleasure. This, this might happen more frequently. We'll, we'll kind of see what the listeners want. We'll, we'll see what the, the people upstairs want. You can find me on Twitter at JLarkyTweets. All my work is on the33rdteam.com. If you're going to those places, uh, I, I think uh, that's about all I can ask. So support Player Profiler, support the 33rd team. You can check out my, my four podcasts a week in Apple and Spotify, the 33rd Team Podcast Network. Thanks, Theo. Yeah. yeah, this was a blast. And definitely uh, check out the Dynasty War Zone. You're used to seeing Dynasty War Zone on Sundays. Dynasty War Zone is now gonna gonna drop right here on Thursdays. And first and fifteen, uh, which is one of my favorite shows with B Bag Batoba, uh, Deo, and Chris, they're gonna be dropping on Friday afternoons here on Player Profiler. So kind of we shift we shuffled the schedule. We got a lot of content. Uh, check out my episode of press coverage with Ray Garvin from a few days ago. That was a really fun one. And then stick stick with us on First Class Fantasy. Every week, Billy Muzio and I are going to have great guests on. Uh, we're going to have, I believe, Davis Maddock next week. And I have Jax Falcone coming on press coverage. Stick with us at Player Profiler. Let's all crush week three. Get Brandon Ayuk out of your lineup. He's not playing tonight, guys. Hey, I want to take a moment to thank you for tuning in. It's important to me that all of our media be free. This is only possible because of you allowing a true independent sports media enterprise to thrive unlike any other in the business. So please subscribe to the All In Package to continue to make all this possible to ensure that all of our stats, information, data, content is available to you, especially you, the people that get the site and get the show.